Good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of Horizon Live. I'm Ara Hachadrian. Joining me today in the studio is Los Angeles City Council member Paul Kokorian from District 2. We're going to have a conversation with him about myriad issues involving the city as well as some uh, discussion about Artsakh. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Joining me today in the studio is Los Angeles City Council member Paul Krikorian, representing the second district of the City Council. Welcome, Mr. Krikorian. It's good to have you back, as always. Thank you, Ada. It's good to be here. The last you. time you were here was before the 2016 election, so we have a lot to catch up on. A lot has changed. Yes, a lot has changed, and we'll touch on some of those issues. But this week is a special week for the Armenian community and Armenians. We mark the 30th anniversary of the start of the Artsakh movement. And I know that through your efforts, Los Angeles is a friendship city with Shushi. And when you went there, there was the opening of the square and all of that, and I've visited it, and it's great. Uh, what are some plans that the city has to develop that friendship city program? Well, um, I should say first that I think the liberation of Shushi and the development of the entire uh, Artsakh liberation movement is, of course, a, a precious phenomenon for all of us in the Armenian community. But it really should be an important um, moment in history, I think, for everyone who cares about freedom and democracy uh, and uh, self-empowerment of, of nations. Uh, this was really the first step to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. and, and so the courageous people of Artsakh who stood up against oppression really changed world history uh, in, the 20th, in the late 20th century. And so um, this is an opportunity, I think, for us to recognize their heroism and recognize how important that was in the development of the modern world that we know today. Um, I'm very proud that Los Angeles has stepped forward, as you mentioned, uh, City Council approved my uh, resolution by which we became a friendship city with Shushi, and that meant a great deal, I know, to the people there. Um, they welcomed us uh, with such enthusiasm when we brought our formal city delegation there, as well as mm -hmm. our state legislative representatives. And um, it, it was very moving. It was one of the most um, important moments, I think, of my public service career. And, and I'm proud that since then, we've continued to develop the relationship through the Los Angeles Shushi Friendship Association. Um, my wife, Tamar, is playing a very important role in helping to lead that effort. And uh, they had a very important first event to raise money to provide music instruments for the music schools in Shushi uh, last year. And this year, coming up on April 29th, they'll have another event which will raise money for scholarships for students uh, in Shushi. Uh, it, and it, it's, it's a fundraising opportunity, but it's also an opportunity for people here in Southern California Armenian and non-Armenian alike, to get to know mm -hmm. Shushi and to get to know Artsakh and what that's all about. Um, it would be an opportunity to expose people to some of the culture, uh, some of the history. Robert Avedisian will be there as, as one of our speakers. Um, so it, it, um, it's an important step forward, I think, in the continuing education of people about the importance of that mm -hmm. relationship. Now, the first event kind of featured some of the local uh, stuff. It was rugs and things made in Artsakh and kind of to introduce that. What is this event, if you can talk a little bit more specifically about that? Well, of course, there will be a cultural component of music and poetry and, and so on. Um, some of the speakers, in addition to the permanent representative, Robert Avedisian, uh, I'll be one of the speakers. Um, Telma Altoon will be one mm. of the speakers. Um, you might have uh, heard about the extraordinary run that she mm -hmm. made through Artsakh, through the historic trails of Artsakh, um, it, which was all very well documented, and she'll talk about that experience and what it means for the future of ecotourism and 
extreme sports there and, and so forth. Um, Gayane Davitian will be there to speak about um, the book that she has about the history of the last uh, 30 years. So um, it, it will be an opportunity for people to learn a little bit about what's going on now, learn a little bit about the history, and experience some of the culture as well. And, and it's very interesting. I, the last time I was in Shushi was last April. And when someone asked me, where am I from? And I said, Los Angeles. And they're like, they like physically took me to that place with the water f fountain and all of that. So they, for them, it's a very important uh, thing. And I'm glad it's going to continue. How do we get more public officials to visit uh, Artsakh? Uh, some people might have some reticence, but how do you go around that? Well, it's sometimes a challenge. Um, I will tell you that when we brought our delegation there, um, the Consul General of Azerbaijan wrote to them and contacted them and tried to put pressure on them uh, from any number of different directions not to go. And um, to the great credit, every member of our delegation um, went ahead and ignored that pressure and went anyway. And, and uh, it was really very gratifying. We brought the Speaker of the Assembly mm -hmm. at that time, John Perez, uh, to, to Hayastan mm -hmm. with us. His schedule didn't allow him. He had to get back to California. He wasn't, allowed, he wasn't able to mm -hmm. join us on that leg of the trip. But he did write a letter to the Consul General of Azerbaijan saying uh, that if any member of the state legislature, le legislature is put on a blacklist because of their visit to Artsakh, put me on that list too, yeah. because I would have gone if I'd been able to. So I think it's a strong I, message. I remember that, and it was, it was really important for, uh, for it to come from the speaker of the California legislature. Um, but speaking of Azerbaijan, I'm seeing a lot more uh, paid activism, if you will, uh, going on, uh, especially uh, this new narrative that look, uh, you know, organizations like the ANCA are supporting Armenia, with, which is supporting Russia. What do you think uh, of that? And uh, do you feel that we need to somehow counter that in, in a more positive way? I think it's one of the most important issues facing uh, the diaspora right now. And it's, it should be one of our most important priorities because the charm offensive, if you will, that Azerbaijan has been on for, you know, many years now, is morphing into the kind of campaign that you're describing, attacking the diaspora and Armenians and our institutions. Um, and I, it concerns me a lot because I see it as a preparation for uh, justification for their aggression. And um, I think if we don't deal with it that way and deal with it forcefully, um, it will uh, enable them uh, or encourage them to continue on the course of aggression that they've been on. Um, I, I think, I, you know, everyone in public office needs to do everything that, that we can to educate our colleagues about the situation. Um, but I think everyone in the diaspora needs to take a role in that. We, uh, and you may remember when I was in the state legislature, it was a similar thing. Mm -hmm. Azerbaijan was asking members of the legislature to recognize um, the great success of President Aliyev and, um, and actually to cite, uh, to, to um, recognize, if you will, the, um, what they called the, the Hojali genocide. The Azeri yeah. genocide, yeah, it was, it was just so disgusting and such a horrifying kind of historical revisionist position. But they did that, and I was able to stop every member of the state legislature, other than one, uh, from mm -hmm. complying with that request. And, and it's those sorts of things where we have to continue to let people know that they're trying to use people as their own tools of propaganda. and. Um, I, I think the, that the other side of that, and the more positive side, is we have to continue to do what we're doing to bring people there, mm -hmm. to let them understand what Artsakh is about, to see the great success that it's had, to, to see the vibrancy of this country and its, uh, its democracy and how well it has done against all odds. Mm -hmm. I think people need to feel that and understand it so that um, all Americans are 
more willing to stand up against Azeri aggression. And it's really interesting because some of the uh, officials, whether they're from Congress, legisl uh, state legislatures, or uh, uh, city uh, officials, they might have that uh, trepidation prior to going, but when they go, they can't stop talking about that's right. it. Uh, and I think that's uh, the, one of the greatest things that the third year movement has brought, this, this uh, intense uh, you know, kind of feeling in Artsakh where they're in war, yet when you go there, it's just, you know, everyone's happy and everyone's so welcoming. And, you know, I guess that's the Armenian way. We're going to continue our conversation. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Joining me today in the studio is Los Angeles City Council member Paul Krikorian. Welcome back. Uh, uh, we've been talking about Artsakh, and uh, it's also a time to celebrate this movement. And you rightfully talked about what a historical impact that movement had in the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, how can we apply that lesson to everything that's going on today? Uh, as I said, you were here before the election. So much has changed, but I'm sure there's a lesson that our, you know, American friends can pick up from that movement. Yeah, I think that the first lesson that I would draw from it, as it applies to um, American democracy, is how precious and how fragile uh, and how vital democracy is, and um, it just it's sometimes very discouraging for me when I see, on the one hand, people willing to put their lives on the line, people standing in front of tanks, people um, strapping their Kalashnikov over their shoulder and climbing up cliffs in order to have the opportunity to live in a democracy where they can represent themselves, on the one hand. And then on the other hand, here in the cradle of democracy, uh, in our third century of democracy here in the United States of America, people barely bother to show up to vote. And we have, in some elections, we have 20% of the people showing up to vote. It's, it's a disgrace, in my view. And the fact that we take our own democracy so for granted and um, just can't be bothered to participate and to make it um, even more vibrant and more representative of all Americans uh, is, I think, the lesson that we need to learn is we need to do a lot better. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the 2018 election certainly will be a test to that. We'll see uh, how that goes. But your district has also evolved since you took office. You were telling me uh, before we started that it is now the largest Armenian uh, populated district in uh, Los Angeles. Talk about that evolution and what are some of the things that the community needs to do in order to keep up with this population change, shift? Well, I think um, obviously throughout Los Angeles the Armenian population has increased over um, the last few decades, of course. And uh, the East Valley has become a, a very rich center of Armenian life, of business and uh, population. And um, it, it's a privilege for me, of course, to be able to be the representative of that population. But you, you really see uh, a wonderful entrepreneurial business community, um, young people who are you know, making their uh, way in, in a new business enterprise here. You see a lot of community building going on in the East Valley. Um, and that's, even though we don't necessarily have the s sort of grounded institutions that Glendale has developed over the course of years. Um, so the people are kind of out there making it happen now. And um, so, so yes, it has changed over the years. Um, but uh, on the other hand, this is kind of the process of what America has always been about as well. Uh, when my parents, uh, when my grandparents arrived here, 
they were facing the same sorts of challenges and they built their businesses and they established themselves here and then built a community around them and uh, we see the same thing happening now for our Armenian immigrants but also for all the other immigrants who are here staking their claim to a little piece of what America is all about. So uh, the shift in the Armenian population in the East Valley, does it come from people are moving away from the traditional community, say Glendale or Hollywood, or are they newcomers that are choosing to settle in uh, North Hollywood, if you can just give us a picture of that? Yeah, it's difficult, I think, to, to draw a single picture about that. Um, part of it is people go where um, they can afford to live. And that's becoming increasingly difficult anywhere in Los Angeles. Uh, with spiking rent prices, it's, it's very difficult. Um, so as rent rates in Glendale have increased, people have moved out for a while. People were moving into Burbank and uh, to La Crescenta and other places, Sun La Dehunga. And I think uh, North Hollywood is also a part of that outward movement as well. But now that there are established elements of the community there, then as newcomers mm -hmm. arrive to Southern California, it's very comfortable for them to go there as well. You talked about the r rising rent prices and also it has a lot to do with uh, redevelopment and I know that your uh, district has some redevelopment projects that have happened and are on and are happening. Uh, what are some of the uh, plans you have to kind of not have that redevelopment fully impact the rents and uh, talk about affordable housing maybe? Well this is one of the great challenges we have in our economy uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, the economy is doing very well. Uh, we have essentially cut the unemployment rate in half in the last eight years. Um, things are very strong. Business starts are way up. Um, business tax revenue that we're receiving in the city is up, which is an indicator of business success. A lot of strong indicators, but the uh, affordability of living in here is getting harder and harder. The gap between average wages and rent costs is getting wider, and that puts tremendous strain on people. So while we're doing well overall, that's a very difficult uh, thing for most families to have to deal with. The price of uh, property to purchase is getting inaccessible to most young people coming out of college or starting out, trying to start a, a new family. The idea of going and buying a house seems like an impossible dream for a lot of families. So it's something that we have to continue to, to work towards. Some of that is a, a function of a hot economy and there's only so much that you can do to restrain that. But we do have a rent control uh, ordinance in the city of Los Angeles, which we are uh, continuing with and protecting, which helps to keep rent um, uh, stable in some of our buildings. Um, we definitely need to build more housing stock. We have to increase the number of units in order to allow the economic forces to, to provide for some affordability. And we have to actually in, increase our subsidies for affordable housing. We've done a lot of that in the current budget. We created a linkage fee so that when developers build uh, luxury apartments, they'll be paying into our affordable housing trust oh, wow. fund so that we can pay for more uh, affordable housing that way. And then, you know, uh, on my own, I've, I've tried to do a number of things working with developers to ensure more affordability too. We have a major development going in uh, at uh, Victory in Laurel Canyon and Oxnard in Laurel Canyon there. Um, is that where the mall or where the Macy's, old Macy's yeah. is? Mm -hmm. It's going to be a beautiful development, commercial, retail, over 600 new units of uh, rental housing. They will be market rate, but as part of our arrangement with the developer on that, we had the developer pay for extensions of affordability covenants throughout the area so that where a house, a, a, an apartment had been um, guaranteed to be affordable for a certain number of years um, and those covenants are expiring, we're now extending those covenants. Oh, okay. So we're, th the existing housing, affordable housing stock is preserved for years to come 
so that we don't have to build new units, we're guaranteeing the continued affordability of those that already are. So it's a cost efficient way to do it. It, it protects people who are already in affordable units. And uh, that's just one strategy of many that we need to continue to exercise so that we maintain some degree of affordability. And residents uh, can uh, apply for, say, these housing uh, things through your office, or is there something else that they could go to? Well, um, with regard to the covenants, those are all yeah. occupied yeah. Uh, currently. But I think um, the Los Angeles uh, Housing Department is probably the first place to go uh, in terms of finding opportunities for affordable housing. Of course, uh, we continue to struggle to have enough vouchers under Section 8 uh, to be able to meet our need. It's not nearly what it needs to be. The federal government needs to do much more to support affordable housing here. And um, we need more landlords who are willing to accept yeah. uh, Section 8 vouchers. And so we're trying to do what we can to create either incentives or even mandates to require that um, some degree of Section 8 uh, set aside be provided so that people who have vouchers actually have mm -hmm. a place to go. We're going to continue this conversation. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're continuing our conversation with uh, LA City Council Member Paul Krikorian. Last time you were here, as I mentioned, it was before the uh, 2016 election, and you were talking about Measure M, uh, which did pass. Can you tell me what's been going on with that? Uh, sure. It was a tremendous success, very exciting. As you know, I serve on the board of the MTA and also on the board of Metrolink, our regional rail system. And uh, Measure M was a dramatic, game-changing moment for Southern California in terms of transportation. And I'm so grateful to the people of Los Angeles for approving it by resounding majority. It was an enormous success. Um, and as a result of that, we have a funding source now to be able to really invest in the future of transportation in Los Angeles. And we're already seeing the results of it. Um, among the projects that are going to be expedited uh, and moving forward now in my area, in the San Fernando Valley, um, we are doing improvements right now to, that will begin construction in 2019 for the Orange Line, for example, which is the most successful uh, rapid bus system in the country. And we're doing improvements there, including grade That's separations. That's the one that runs on Chandler, right? It, yeah, more yeah. or less. It runs yeah. east-west across the San Fernando mm -hmm. Valley and then connects with the Red Line yeah. in North Hollywood. So it's a great success, um, overcrowded almost all the time. Uh, so we're what we're doing is increasing uh, capacity and increasing speed by investing more in the Orange Line. We're building a light rail line that's going to go north-south through the east San Fernando Valley, along mostly along Van Nuys Boulevard. A uh, new light rail system will go in there. Um, we're doing improvements, we're planning improvements right now and using some of this Measure M money to, to plan for the future of the Sepulveda Pass um, because as you know, the Sepulveda Pass is one of the worst bottlenecks anywhere in America. Even with all of the investment and freeway widening, it's just not enough. So we're looking to have a transit connection through the Sepulveda Pass, a rail connection, uh, might even involve tunneling through the, the mountain. Those are, that's a, the kind of big mm -hmm. project that will affect the entire region that could only be possible because of Measure M. Mm -hmm. so, Things are already in the works. This is a measure that will create a half million jobs, good jobs in Southern California, and it will really increase mobility to people. It's going to fund more bus service. It's going to fund increases to uh, street resurfacing and other kinds of improvements like that to our local transit, as well as uh, pedestrian access by sidewalk repairs and things like that, bicyclist uh, safety. There's a lot of good things that are going to come from Measure mm -hmm. M. 
Well, I'm, I'm a user of public transportation, so... And we appreciate uh, it's, it. It's, Thank it's you. It's great, and it is a great system that we have. Uh, uh, but there were recent reports uh, that the LA Times also uh, mentioned that the ridership on uh, the uh, public transportation is decreasing because people are still continuing to buy cars and uh, you know so how do you explain that that you guys are putting in all this effort to you know better this uh, public transportation system and I can tell you as someone who's been doing it for 15 years it's day and night a difference to 2003 or 4 uh, so how do you encourage people to leave their cars at home? Sure. Let me say first that the LA Times continues to make this argument, and it's a legitimate concern, but they're comparing uh, the time period from when we had some of the highest gas prices to now when we have gas prices that are much lower. and so. It's not necessarily a fair comparison because transit ridership fluctuates wildly mm -hmm. with gas prices. When gas is more expensive, people take yeah. transit. When it's less expensive, they drive. So, but that being said, this is a nationwide trend. And it's in part because of transportation networking companies like Uber and Lyft, you know, have made it a little easier for people to get around without a car. Um, Gas prices are relatively low now, so there's people, and the economy is doing better, so people are buying more cars and driving them more. So those are concerns. That being said, I think there is always going to be an essential need for backbone public transportation in a place as big as Los Angeles. And what Measure M has allowed us to do is to mature the system. So, for example, I take the red line a lot. It's very easy for me because it goes from where I live to where I work. But if I didn't happen to live there or work there, it would be much harder to access. Now, with Measure M and the increase in the number of rail lines that we'll have, the increase in bus service, all of those other things, it becomes much easier for people to get from anywhere to anywhere. And as you see, when that happens, then you see geometric increases in the usefulness of the system and so more people will ride. So um, w the other thing that we have to do is make sure that people understand that this is a system that is safe and it's clean and it's, uh, it's attractive to people. And I think one of the biggest concerns that a lot of people who aren't transit dependent have is I'm not sure if I'll be safe. And so we've put great emphasis in trying to ensure visible law enforcement throughout the system. We've just, Metro just um, reached a contract with the Los Angeles Police Department to provide um, security on our system. It used to be just the county sheriff. Mm -hmm. Now it's the sheriff, the LAPD, and the Long Beach Police Department all participating. And we've seen a great increase, I think, in the visibility of law enforcement on the system. And I think most people feel much more comfortable because of that. I think it's also something that the public needs to be educated about because Los Angeles is such a car city um, and I think another generation might have a more uh, affinity uh, toward it. I can tell you the uh, line that started coming into Santa Monica a couple of years ago is always uh, packed and it's created new uh, ways for people to come and visit the beach community. So it, it is a great thing, and I'm going to tell you in, at home to start using public transportation. <laughs> it's good for the environment. Absolutely. Uh, is, are there some projects that are being fast-tracked uh, because the Olympics are coming to L.A. in 10 years? Well, y yes. Um, I, I will say that we had planned to have uh, all of the lines that are currently under construction and in, in the immediate pipeline to be finished in time for the 2024 Olympics. <laughs> so now that we've been awarded the 2028 <laughs> Olympics, we, I'm certain that we'll have those all finished in time for the Olympics, but it is a great boost because um, I think where it'll be most helpful is um, in securing federal funding for projects that will allow us then to accelerate construction. None of these projects are ever built entirely with local money. They, they're yes. built with a combination of local money, federal, even some state money, and so on. So because the Olympics is a matter of national importance, 
every time it comes around. Um, we expect that we'll get a greater attention from Washington for our projects because of the 2028 Olympics. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is it looking like for 2028? Will the purple line make its way to Westwood by then? Well, um, we're just about to break ground on the next leg of the purple line, as, as you probably know. Um, that has been one of the more challenging projects because of some opposition to station siting by the city of Beverly Hills. And uh, there have been some challenges there. But to your point, um, we have rail service now to Santa Monica for the first mm -hmm. time in 80 years. Yeah. And people see that, and uh, they see how successful that is, and, and they want more. People who live on the west side of Los Angeles, who right now are sitting in gridlocked traffic to try to get home from work every single night, I, I think there's a new demand for this, which hopefully will accelerate these things even more. And I, I think to your point earlier, it is generational, too. Yeah. Um, there's an entire generation of young people now who don't buy into this idea that L.A. is a car-centric place. They would rather live in places where they don't even need to own a car, where they can live in places where the housing is you know, a dense community with places to work and places to be entertained and places to shop all in one place where they can ride their bike or their skateboard or take public transit. That's what this um, generation of young people wants. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to continue to make those investments so that we um, allow this city to continue to flourish, protect the environment, as you say. Um, it also helps with the affordability of housing, yeah. too. If you can get to work mm -hmm. from places that are further away, there's a greater chance of finding an affordable yeah. place to live. But if you have to sit in two hours or three hours of traffic to do that, just not going to do it. Yeah. We're going to continue this conversation. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. My guest is Los Angeles City Councilman Paul Krikorian, and we had a very exciting conversation about public transportation. I do want to pause and tell all of you that you should take public transportation. It's good for you, and it's also good for the environment. Uh, one of the issues that also uh, came into play during the elections and is continuing to be a, a rather visible problem is the homelessness mm -hmm. issue. We've had problems with our institutions, uh, where especially schools and whatnot, where the students have come in and uh, you know there have been uh, homeless there at the uh, you know entrances. What is the city doing about this uh, issue? Well, I, I will say this is the most catastrophic uh, social challenge that I think we've faced in my lifetime, and um, it's unacceptable in the 21st century, in the richest country in the history of the world, that we um, can have 25,000 people living on the streets of the city of Los Angeles tonight. That's yes. intolerable, uh, and it should be intolerable you know, to everyone. Um, and it has impacts, as you say, on communities, on children, and so on. But you should also remember that the homeless population themselves yes. include children mm -hmm. and people who are going to those schools, um, for example. So uh, our task is to try to provide um, housing and opportunity for the most vulnerable people living in Los Angeles, and at the same time protect our neighborhoods and communities from so many of the adverse impacts that come from homelessness. And uh, it is the most urgent issue I face every day. So among other things, uh, one of the things th that we've done in, in our office is we've focused on developing permanent supportive housing. This is the ultimate solution to those who are struggling with homelessness, to get them housed in, uh, in a place that's going to create a supportive environment so that they can stay housed. 
deal with whatever issues they have of, you know, mental or emotional health, substance abuse or whatever, so that they're permanently taken off the street. In the meantime, we have to do much more to develop more shelter space mm -hmm. so that people aren't living on the sidewalks. Um, we have to do much more to provide sanitation and hygiene, and we're doing that. We've expanded the number of what we call our HOPE teams that go out and do cleanups of encampments, but also do outreach to the homeless to get them to, to services. Um, one of the things that we launched in my office was our Homeless Connect Day. We've done about a dozen of them now where we bring the homeless into one place where we bring the service providers to them. Oh, wow. So we'll feed, feed them a meal, we'll ask them questions about what their needs are, and then we'll literally walk them to the person who can solve their problem. So this has been a great success in getting people into housing, but also solving the underlying problems that are keeping them, that have kept them homeless in the first place. It's been a tremendous success. Um, we're also looking right now in, uh, in the East Valley of trying to identify safe parking locations so that the people who are now living in RVs in neighborhoods, and sometimes you'll see them all lined mm -hmm. up, it's not safe for them, it's terrible for the neighborhood. So we want to get them off of the streets and into parking lots where they can be, where it can be monitored, where there can be some safety, where there can be some hygiene, um, and so it's better for them, it's better for the neighborhoods. So um, those are a few examples. We, the, the people of Los Angeles have made clear that this is urgent and that the people are willing to join with us in solving this problem. The people have voted to tax themselves to solve this problem. And so um, we're doing it, we're moving forward. We've committed, a number of the members of the council have committed to building over 200 units of supportive housing in each one of our council districts uh, in the next two years. We're already halfway there in my district um, and we're going to make it the rest of the way. So those are the sorts of steps that need to be taken that people need to see that we're taking so that they know that um, it, it's a matter of great urgency and it's not something I will say that's going to go away in a month or a year. It's a problem that's developed over the course of a half a century or so of income disparity, lack of affordable housing, lack of attention to mental health issue and s issues and substance abuse issues, um, lack of protection for victims of domestic violence who then end up becoming homeless because of that. There's so many things, so many social elements to this that frankly our country and our society has neglected for generations now that this is not a problem that we're going to solve immediately but we are going to solve it by remaining vigilant and continuing to press uh, to make progress in all of these areas um, and treat it like the urgent crisis that it is because it is very much that. And uh, in reality, we could have spent the past hour just talking about this issue, and I'm so happy that you pointed to some of the uh, root causes. Uh, I wonder, and maybe we can pick that up next time, whether this uh, you know, fast-tracked gentrification that we're seeing in so many neighborhoods has been some of uh, has been the cause of uh, the proliferation of the. Uh, problem. I mean, we see it here in uh, Little Armenia, a little bit past in Silver Lake Echo Park. I see it uh, in my district in West LA and Venice. And uh, it's something that I'm glad you uh, talked about the root cause of uh, those issues because a lot of people don't uh, understand that there are so many factors that play into this. And it is a shame we for have, Los Angeles. <laughs> we have 35,000 homeless folks in the city itself. Yeah. 25,000 of them are unsheltered, mm -hmm. but there are many more who are right there on the edge. And one sickness, yeah. one lost job, mm -hmm. one family crisis, and they could be homeless as well. And yeah. many of us uh, would be in that situation. And I, I hope that people will treat the issue with the kind of compassion that that situation uh, demands as well. And you, you do have our support here at Aspares and Horizon if there's something that we can do to kind of uh, make this, uh, to get the word out and uh, make everyone understand that, you know, these are all part of our society. 
they're part of the same city that we live in. I think that's uh, important. Very quickly, we only have about uh, a minute and a half. I want to go back to Artsakh. We, there's so many issues that we could talk sure. about, but I want to go back to Artsakh, and I want to tell everyone to mark your calendars for April 29th, which is going to be uh, the Shushi issue. Uh, what, what can the community do to encourage more officials to visit, to make this Shushi Los Angeles uh, experience uh, much more visible uh, than it has been? I think a lot of it is just simple education. I think most Armenians uh, will not ever miss the opportunity to educate people about the genocide, and as we should. This, the other thing that we ought to include in every one of those conversations is that the people of Artsakh you know, are an inch away from facing a recurrence of genocide if we are not vigilant about protecting them and ensuring that the entire civilized world uh, does so as well. So I think whenever we have an opportunity to have a conversation with an elected official, and not even an elected official, anyone mm -hmm. who doesn't understand this issue, we should do it, whether in the business community, in our schools, in our churches. Um, people need to understand how important this is. They need to understand the historical context of Artsakh, and they need to understand the vulnerability that the, those people are mm -hmm. facing right now in the threat of outrageous, inexcusable threats of aggression. Yeah. Especially since uh, the liberation movement came at the price when Sumgait happened a week later, and uh, my headline today was, we lost another Artsakh soldier uh, to Azerbaijani aggression. So it's important to address this as you know, vocally as we are, the genocide issue and, uh, and other issues. And maybe that, uh, also talking to some uh, you know, political officials who visited there and seen what a great time they had, maybe people will be uh, more uh, apt to go. Uh, Councilman Krikorian, thank you. You should come back more often because I always enjoy having a conversation. It's very, you bring so much to the table. And thank you. Uh, come it's back a again. Pleasure. It's great uh, to be with you, and I'm happy to come anytime. Okay. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, see you next time.